Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be continuing the Otto von Bismarck series by Extra History. We're going to be doing part 5. It's called Prussia Ascendant, which sounds straight out of an anime and I'm absolutely down with it. I really enjoyed the previous one. We have some awesomely clever imperialism and as somebody who's not really huge into imperialism and that sort of stuff that it's usually something that turns me away um i can appreciate somebody who's clever i guess uh it's when i view history more as a story and when, when it's so separated from us by uh, a gulf of time. It's so much easier to read history, look at history, and be like, uh, okay, it's a story. <laughs> and sometimes I end up doing that, especially with periods and places that I don't study formally. So I, I, I guess I'm just kind of having a blast with this one. So I'm excited to get started. Let, let's not waste any time. We got normal dude at the beginning. He's starting this one off. Hey, folks. Before we start, allow me to introduce our newest extra history artist, Nick. He'll be taking over Hi, for David, who is now hard at work on our new extra sci-fi series. Say hello. They have extra sci-fi? I, I know they have a lot of stuff, and like I've been thinking about checking out uh, extra mythology, I think it was, because it's good to understand mythology and stuff, and that's not really... Uh, it's not really my go-to thing, uh, but I, I, if it's half as good as their history stuff, I feel like I'll, I'll have a lot of fun with it. So if you'd be interested in seeing anything on mythology, I, I think uh, I'd be down with it. Let me know in the comments. Any and by liking this video. Brings an increase in enemies. But to Bismarck, enemies were as useful as friends. With the defeat of Austria and the consolidation of the northern German states into one hegemony ruled by Prussia, Bismarck's eye turned to the next problem, founding Germany. But to do this, he would need to bring all of the southern German states... Yeah, this is something that I didn't fully understand. Uh, any conversation about the founding of Germany that I've seen comes in relation to World War One and the lead up to World War One. because to understand that you have to know that Germany is on the scene and have been on the scene and uh, might be a threat to the rest of Europe if things were to go down. But I, I guess understanding it from the inside is something that I've not fully appreciated because my, uh, my scope on history is very American and sometimes British. Sometimes British, depending on uh, the period we're talking about. That's that's just what it's happened to be. Uh, I'm, I'm down with uh, getting outside of my comfort zone, though, so this is cool. ...states under his control. He knew he couldn't simply annex them by force. He needed a unified Germany. A Germany that felt like a country, not some occupied territory under a foreign rule. And for Sounds that, wise. the southern German states would have to come to him willingly, of their own volition. But they had always been aligned like the with Austria, 1984 so how could he get them to volunteer to be absorbed into Prussia? To he would need an external threat, something that would make these states more afraid of other nations, and see Prussia as the benevolent protector and cultural brother that they could turn to in their time of need. And Sounds what like a great better idea. enemy than France? Napoleon III, who had been willing to stand by and let Prussia pick off its neighbors back when it was a minor power, suddenly woke up and realized that a power to rival France had just emerged on its border. Already upset about the fact that he hadn't gotten any territory as a bribe for staying neutral in the war between Prussians and Austrians, Napoleon was primed and ready for a conflict with Prussia. But there was a problem. Both Prussia and France needed the other one to be the aggressor. Neither wanted to risk international rebuke or the possibility of foreign intervention in their cause. But Bismarck had a plan. Bismarck, Bismarck always has a plan. His plan was Sorry. wait until circumstances there. presented themselves that allowed him to formulate an advantageous plan. So he did. Then huh. the queen... You know... Like, that sounds like, and they have him in a hammock and it seems lazy or whatever, but, like, that makes sense. Like, sometimes, you, it, while it is a great leadership approach to, like, form the world to your liking and create the circumstances in which you want to work with, uh, sometimes that level of aggression can be somebody's downfall. So uh, knowing to wait is uh, also a very important leadership tactic. I, I, 
I appreciate that. I, I, for a second there, I thought he was uh, like this superhuman leadership machine that was going to somehow work around this. And, uh... I, I I don't know and make this happen, but no, no, he he uh, he has to wait back. He has to wait for circumstances. That feels way more human than a lot of the previous stuff has felt. Queen of Spain was suddenly kicked out of Spain by revolutionaries. Bismarck knew it was go time. Sick. Because when a European monarch vacates their throne, there is always a multinational scramble for succession. In this mm. case, you'd think it would be less complicated because the Spanish kicked out their monarch and were essentially choosing a new one for themselves instead of trying to untangle and war over some Byzantine genealogical tree. But no, they instead decided to offer the crown of Spain to a German prince. Bismarck was all for this. Dude! For Prince Leopold to accept the offer, despite the fact that, that his name great. didn't even have Wilhelm in it anywhere. He knew full well that Napoleon III would have to rage against this offer. After all, if Spain ever allied with Prussia, which would be far more likely with a Prussian prince on the Spanish throne, France would be surrounded. King Wilhelm was... Yeah, while, uh, while Spain is far from, like, its peak of power... I mean, they're nothing to sneeze at. Um, as, as far as uh, uh, <laughs> being taken from both sides is something you'll always want to avoid. Uh, I don't know if my now, now I'm thinking about it. Like I don't know if I'm uh, downplaying Spain a little bit too much because the the Spain that I understand is uh, is uh, and have studied more deeply is more on the decline uh, probably at its biggest decline since uh, its uh, imperial peak I, I don't know how much it may have come back at this period at, at this time but uh, I don't think they were considered too great of a threat on their own, like in, a, in maybe like a one-on-one -on -one conflict. Was against this, and even Prince Leopold didn't see great prospects in being king of a country that had spent most of the last century in revolt, but Bismarck's diplomacy prevailed, and the offer was accepted. All of these it's deals a job. were kept a very... It's, it's another one of those cases, and we talked about that in the previous one, of jobs that you might not want, because if you can't succeed at the job, you might just not want to take it. Because the consequences of not succeeding, the, the, the consequences of failing your job may be worse than just not having the job at all. Very close secret, though. If France found out too early, the consequences could be disastrous. What Bismarck needed was for Leopold to be proclaimed king by the legitimate assembly of the people of Spain before Napoleon could make a move. That way, if France declared war over it, the world would see them as the aggressors. Everything went perfectly. On June 19th, 18th, I'm really liking the Leopold art in this one. agreed to accept the throne. Two days later, he sent a coded telegraph to Madrid saying that he would arrive around the 29th. But then history turned, as it so often does, on a small thing. A cipher clerk made an error in decoding the message and wrote the 9th oh, of July. No. The Spanish legislature couldn't be held in session that long and thus was dismissed on June 23rd, which meant that when Leopold arrived in Spain, there there was nobody present to make him king. People no. started noticing this Prussian prince kicking around in Madrid fairly quickly, and word reached the French papers. Soon, all of France was up in arms. So, not everything went perfectly. But Bismarck... So that's basically a coincidence that screwed this over. Like, I, I don't know how bad this particular incident is gonna get, but, like, I was just talking, like, and I did the last couple episodes like right before this i've been watching them all kind of in one sitting here so if you've corrected me on anything in the comments in the past two i haven't read them yet but uh i assure you i will get around to reading them eventually but in in this case uh i, I talked in the previous one about how Sometimes the littlest things can change somebody's trajectory, it, like in relation to how uh, Bismarck ended up basically being put in charge, uh, because just the circumstances around him, right place, right time sort of thing. This is like the opposite of that, man. You were about to be given the world.
soon, all of France was up in arms. So not everything went perfectly. But Bismarck now played the spider, waiting silently. He knew that he couldn't be seen directing affairs. The spider. All he had to do was wait for the French to offer some Not insult, the most noble and then nickname, pounce on but I like that it. to have the war he wanted. <clears throat> but he didn't factor in Wilhelm. The king had always been opposed to the prince running off and taking the Spanish throne, so when the French outcry flared up, the Prussian monarch put his foot down and told Leopold to withdraw his nomination. This was a huge diplomatic win for France. But, like always, Napoleon III pushed it too far. He sent a diplomat to ask Wilhelm to... Hold on. Is Napoleon III pushed it... That walk cycle, like, you can tell they have a new animator. Like, it, that's something I haven't diplomat. seen much of in their stuff so far. That That's, like, really cool. I'm excited to see them develop. I don't, I don't know if I've seen any, like, newer, newer stuff. I don't think I have. I think most of the stuff I've seen is pretty old. And if I end up taking it more towards the old stuff, working my way towards the new stuff, um... I'm excited to see how their uh, style develops because this is it, it's really cool seeing them take these little steps. Dramatic win for France, but like it's always, him take Napoleon these little III steps. pushed it too far. He sent a diplomat to ask Wilhelm to swear that no Hohenzollern would ever sit on the Spanish throne. The king found this mildly insulting, as there was no way he would promise something like that in perpetuity. And besides, he had already pulled Leopold from the throne, and it wasn't likely to come up again. He felt that he had already been perfectly reasonable about this. So he replied that he could promise no such thing, and sent the French ambassador away. Then he had a quick telegram sent to Bismarck relaying the incident and granting him permission to inform the press. But Bismarck always had a way with vague instructions and with words. Oh no. He did indeed inform the press, but the message he passed along to them the was French carefully edited. It. Okay. it wasn't false, per se. It wasn't even really a misrepresentation. He just omitted some words. Omitted some words in such a brilliant way that when the German people read it, they would think the French ambassador had insulted their king. And and when the French read it, they would think that the Prussian king had insulted their ambassador. That did the trick. The people were up in arms, and the French were ticked. Paris all the more so, because, coincidentally, the telegram happened to come out on Bastille Day. And Napoleon III needed a war. His regime was largely unsuccessful, and his foreign entanglements had been a disaster. He thought that if he could crush Prussia and gain territory for France, he would be back on stable footing. Soon, hundreds that would of thousands be of French absolutely troops huge, were yeah. pouring across the Prussian border. Uh, France, for them to gain European land would be absolutely massive. Like, uh, they've historically been able to make colonial gains and stuff, but to, to get, make some mainland gains, uh, that would be a game changer. It's, it's a huge what if. It's not going to happen. Um, the balance of... Uh, European powers as they were, they, it seems very unlikely. It, like the German states, like that. That's one thing. Uh, they had that. Uh, they had that ethnic element that was like pulling them together while they were also trying to pull each, pulling apart while pulling together, and you're know, fighting between the two. Oh, now we're finally together! Yay! Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't see. That, that, that seems like wishful thinking. Even if you did gain it, you'd be uh, occupying some uh, ethnically German people who would probably not be happy being under the uh, French regime, which that might be more trouble than it's worth in some ways. I, I don't know. Imperialism, in a sense... Uh, it's a, a double-edged sword, and I've used that term wrong recently. This is like the real, the proper use of uh, double-edged sword, where like uh, even if you win, uh, you might end up dealing with more bullcrap than you're ready for. <laughs> Bismarck had his defensive war. The French had invaded, and he had the moral high ground. In response, the southern German states flocked to the Prussian banner. But he played a dangerous game. By letting the French invade the Prussians, he had allowed them to mobilize first. Now the German army had to get into position before their country was overrun. But here, Bismarck had the greatest weapon, Moltke. 
The French had Mulkey. better rifles than the Germans, but the Germans had better ideas about modern war. Prussian observers had studied the American Civil War and knew that a train schedule could be as powerful a tool as any gun. Moltke oh, embraced yeah. the idea of the... The American Civil War is probably, like, some of the best reference material for modern military conflict at the time, I suppose. Um, it's also oh, got a lot of negative examples to learn from. Lots of mistakes were made in the American Civil War, and if you could, uh, if you could learn from those mistakes, uh, this is a great way to adapt to more modern conflict at the time. I, I, I like that the railroad and the telegraph. With coordination and these new technologies for movement, he not only got the German army to the front in time, he got more men there than the French did. But he did more than just this. He rewrote the rules so that German units no longer simply marched in great columns and fought in great lines, but rather acted as small units less susceptible to fire. He pushed the idea that, since piercing the center of an army was no longer as much of a concern due to the deadly nature of modern rifles, they should worry less about artillery getting overrun and more about how effective it was in a fight. So he moved his artillery closer to the action and had them working in conjunction with his units. He had a general staff, the only one in Europe, whose sole purpose was to draw up war plans in peacetime and think through all of the probable scenarios of coming conflicts. With these the advantages and a superiority in numbers, Moltke immediately took the offensive, rapidly pushing the French back across the border and charging into French territory. Time and again, the French reeled before the Prussian forces. Soon, the French armies were falling back, trying to link up with reserves further down the line. But the retreating army was spotted by a small cavalry brigade, and nearby Prussian forces were ordered to move in and cut them off. Unfortunately, due to some wild miscalculations by both sides, the Prussians had just sent 30,000 men to engage what turned out to be 130,000. The French oh no. were beleaguered and demoralized, but yeah, had an dude. overwhelming advantage in men. The Prussians were ready for the fight, but ended up pinned by the French artillery. In desperation, the Prussian commander sent a message to a nearby cavalry commander, saying that the artillery must be cleared. Famously, the cavalry commander said, It will cost what it will cost, and readied his men. Obscured what a by the chad. terrain, they burst what an through the cannon smoke chad. at the last minute, bearing down on the foe, giving them only a thousand meters to react. The cavalry crashed into the artillery and tore through it, silencing the batteries that had so long hampered the Prussian army. This is arguably the last cavalry charge to significantly change the course of a battle in modern military history. But even a thousand meters is a long that's ride really cool. when you've got modern guns firing at you. That that's very cool. Uh, that that's a uh, that's one of those like fun facts, but like actually a useful fun fact, I suppose. Some some trivia like. I, I, I'm not the biggest trivia person, honestly. Um, there are some people who are just trivia machines. I think that's a piece of trivia that's really cool. Um, and it really does symbolize uh, moving on militarily. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Of the cool. 800 horsemen who set out, only 420 made it back. And it turns out that Bismarck's son was among this regiment. <laughs> nice. It was late in the night of August 16th, 1870, when a messenger arrived to tell Bismarck his eldest son was dead. Quartered only 20 miles away from the battlefield, Bismarck rode like a man possessed to find the body of his son, only to be greeted by his very much alive son laughing and joking in a farmhouse nearby. He had taken a bullet to the leg and would be out of the fighting, but was in no mortal danger. After a few Aww. more hard-fought victories, the Prussian forces bottled up the French at Metz and forced the that surrender warmed of 140,000 men. Heart the French a only had bit. one. <laughs> Normally, I'm I'm willing to laugh at people's suffering because it's history. Like, who cares? It's been like, like it's been like a hundred years or however many years it happens to be based on the subject. And like, I'll look at people's suffering and then I'll just make a joke. Uh, but that actually warmed my heart a little bit. So that's that's kind of nice. An army left. I'm growing attached to this guy. I have already grown attached to this guy. I don't think I like him that much. I. I it, I don't feel like we'd be homies or anything like that, but honestly, I'm, I'm invested in his journey, so that's something. To them, an army battered by an attempt to relieve the forces at Metz. But Moltke had no intention of letting this force get away. And in the days following the surrender at Metz, he maneuvered his forces and encircled this final army. 
A breakout attempt was made, but so exhausted and undersupplied were the French at this point, it soon became clear that a breakout was impossible. By the next day, a mm. hundred thousand men, and with them the greatest prize of all, Napoleon III, who was personally leading this army, surrendered. France no Dude. longer had a real army on the field. Now Epic. it was time to think about the future. For Bismarck, that meant peace terms. You did a great job, Almost purple haired dude. That meant pushing on to Paris. So we only have one left, right? Jeez, it, feel, it feels like this series has flown by over the course of an hour, because in my time, it has, because I just haven't stopped watching it. Um, I guess, if, if it is just six episodes, I guess I'm just going to go finish it now, um, and you'll see that video tomorrow. Uh, th this has been really cool. Um, I'm usually not super invested in the military stuff, but they were able to present it in a way, like, I think framing it in a way of, like, showing how much military has changed made it more engaging for me, so I, I thought that was uh, pretty cool. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll call this one here and then I'll go film the next one and I'll be back tomorrow with that and we'll, uh, we'll conclude this and we'll, and I'll figure out what I'm going to be doing next as far as extra history stuff goes. Thanks for watching guys and I will see you tomorrow. All right. Bye.